Welcome to the SAG After Foundations, the business program. I'm Perry Nemiroff, senior producer at Collider. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our showrunners today. We have Liz Merriweather for The Dropout, Robin Veith for Candy, Lee Eisenberg for We Crashed, Maggie Cohn for The Staircase, and Patrick McManus for The Girl from Plainville and Dr. Death. Hello, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I think it's something special that we're representing so many different shows. And I can truly, from the bottom of my heart, say congratulations on your incredible work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Patrick, I'm sorry to do this to you. But because you're the one pulling double duty here, it felt like mm. I just needed to give you this question. To kick sure. us off here, can you explain to everyone exactly what a showrunner does? <laughs> uh, a showrunner, in my opinion, uh, has hundreds of people who do, do all the hard work and they get all the credit. Uh, that's pretty much sums it all up for me. Um, but if I have to dig down a little bit deeper on that, uh, it's pretty much a nuts and bolts operation from the very beginning to the very end, right? You're, uh, if, you, if you're lucky, you have the opportunity to be able to, to get a, a show off the ground from the pitch stage and you piece together a writer's room uh, from, that, from that place. Uh, if you're able to set it up to, to series, uh, you run that writer's room at least for part of the time. And then hopefully you've got a really solid room that's able to do a lot of the heavy lifting while you're off pretending to write in your office when in reality you're shopping online. Uh, and then that's really, I, I don't do a lot of shopping online. Uh, and then, uh, you are in pre-production, production and post, right? So you are, you are ultimately responsible for hiring, uh, for hiring the crew. Um, the most important hire, in my opinion, that you make is the line producer who I've always said from the very beginning is the person, if you've hired correctly is actually running the show, uh, and making you look good with all the things that you don't know how to do. Um, and, and then you're, you're straight through, uh, you know, through to post and, and in between you're dealing with the actors you're doing rewrites. Um, uh, and it quite frankly is a job that I am very lucky to be able to do. And I, and while it's exhausting, um, it is genuinely the greatest job in the industry. And now we are all going to go around and rate Patrick's description. <laughs> <laughs> to, to get everyone to chime in on this a little bit. I know a lot of you have uh, a good deal of experience in other positions as well, produ producing, uh, writing, and then some. So with all of that experience, when you jumped into the role of showrunner for the very first time, is there anything about the job description that surprised you the most? Something that even with all your prior experience, you did not realize a showrunner was responsible for? You have to protect the project creatively, um, which is a bit difficult when a lot of the um, discussions are about the tangible, whether it's about how many hours you have in the day or the budget, you somehow have to rally people behind an idea or a theme or a concept that on the page and in practice might seem a bit ridiculous and really hard to do and pull off in that moment or in that day, but ultimately, you know, is going to make the show. Um, so I think it's a bit um, of being a politician and a bit of a ringleader. Um, and I guess that performative quality to it for me was a bit of a surprise um, because it's something I like to avoid at all costs. <laughs> Yeah, I would agree with Maggie. Like that really shocked me. It's just like <clears throat> how many times I've had to resell my show yeah. <laughs> like, on a daily basis because it is a much bigger part of the job than I thought was just hype man of just like keeping people excited about it. And, you know, when you're told absolutely no, we can't afford it, we can't do this, we can't get this base. And, and you say like, can I just have one second to pitch you why this is important to me? And then, you know, like someone's literally on the, like texting and by the time you're done repitching it, they're just like, okay, it's done. And it's like, <laughs> and clearly I'm not doing enough online shopping. <laughs> <laughs> Lee, Liz, anything you want to add to that one? I was really surprised that the, um, you know, I came up working under um, Greg Daniels on The Office and Greg was, this brilliant guy and he always made the right decision. 
and then all of a sudden I started writing my own stuff and, uh, and, and it was getting picked up and then people turned to me and it was like, you're the, like the buck stops with me was a very weird concept that I was like, I want to look back and say like, well, surely someone else is going to do the final polish of the script or someone else is going to make the decision in the edit. And then there are just so many decisions. I mean, over the course of a day, like the number of emails from different departments and you're approving clouds in a VFX thing, there's a song that hasn't cleared and you have to do this. And there's an actor who missed their plane or there's COVID there, I and mean, there's just a million things you're dealing with. So I think most of us or all of us started off as writers. And then all of a sudden you're just kind of tacked onto this other thing where you're the CEO of a, a company that has that tens of millions of dollars are your responsibility and 200 people are kind of are looking to you for the answers. Yeah. I was going to say, I feel like the, um, the experience of running the dropout was so different for me than the experience of running new girl. Um, it almost felt like I got on dropout. I got to be a writer <laughs> on, on new girl. I was like, uh, I don't know, just like, like walking down the hall a lot, you know, <laughs> <It was like laughs> just sending a lot of emails and like, <laughs> like going to meetings and yeah so I, I actually think like the um experience for me of not doing network and doing streaming for the first time actually felt like I got to have like a mix of being a writer and actually being a producer that is very exciting to hear so Robin I'm going to come your way to get into uh this particular question how involved is a showrunner in the casting process and I choose you for this because I did have a conversation with Melanie and she told me an interesting casting story about Jason where it just happened to come up that it was something in a text chain that you were on and then it just happened so I am imagining that you were heavily involved in that part of the process I was heavily involved um you know the, the, the we we started out with our star Jessica Beale, um, and then at, she's the one who got the whole project rolling. And then the network asked me, like, "What are you thinking about Betty, who plays opposite Jessica? Like, what type are you thinking?" And I said, "There is no type. It's Melanie Linsky. I'm not even saying Melanie Linsky type. It's Melanie Linsky. Go get her." Um, and we did, fortunately. And, um, you know, it, it, the casting I was heavily involved with, as well as, you know, Michael Uppendahl, the director, and um, everyone, and, and Carrie Audino and Lara Schiff are, are casting directors who I knew from, from Mad Men. Like, so I've known these people for 10 years. So they, they kind of knew what I was going for anyway, and also knew like who they could push, you know, that may have not have crossed my mind, but would be like, oh, you know, because I love to do weird things. Um, but, uh, yeah, we were approaching, um, Christmas break and because my, the actors were so lovely, we had like a text chain of me and all the actors and, um, Melanie sent a photo of her husband, Jason Ritter with her daughter, like a Christmas photo. And Jason just had this enormous mustache. <laughs> So like uh, all the other actors started chiming in and just like, this looks like an audition for the show. And I was like, he looks like the mayor of the town. Um, and so I said to Melanie, I was like, God, is there any world where he's in Atlanta? Does he, does he want to come play? And she's like, he would love to. And then the first thing we did was shave off the mustache. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a very nice surprise when, uh, when him and Justin popped up. I enjoyed that quite a bit. All right, Maggie, I'm coming your way with this one. Can you speak a little bit about your approach to casting a show that is inspired by a true story in terms of how many similarities you want to see between the actor that you're considering and the real person they're going to play? How much does that dictate your decision in the casting process? Um, when we were approaching the staircase, Antonio and I, my co-showrunner, um, it was pr actually pretty important to to demonstrate that we weren't trying to replicate the real life people in any way. Um, the philosophy behind the entire show was more about embodiment um, and like the essence of the characters. Uh, so essentially it was looking for trying to create a, a family alchemy. So it was more about the chemistry that we hoped the actors would have with one another and just casting people whose performances we were had already been impressed by. Um, so 
for us, it was actually the opposite was true. It was kind of to show and demonstrate to the viewers that this wasn't something we were attempting to, to duplicate or replicate um, literally. Does anyone have an example of when the opposite was true on their show, or maybe even a situation where you knew that this role, you had to prioritize similarities versus another one where you could strictly go after a creative collaborator that you really believed in, regardless of similarities or not? Yeah, I look, I'll go and just say, I agree with Maggie wholeheartedly, which is that no, uh, there was never an instance in which, in which on either one, on Dr. Death or a Girl from Plainville, in which we specifically went after somebody who was going to look the role. But I will say that the first time that I met with Elle Fanning, who who, who, is, who plays Michelle Carter and the Girl from Plainville, uh, we met for drinks just to discuss her possible interest in it. And the similarities were kind of uncanny unto themselves just and it wasn't why we cast her she was interested in the role uh before we you know before the, the ball got rolling um and then she transformed herself uh quite frankly into michelle carter but it didn't take prosthetics it, it was it was really just a, a a makeup and hair job that we ended up doing that she was she was vital to to helping to design that because she did want to make there's a there's a massive transformation of what michelle carter how she starts to how she ends in in her journey, and Elle felt like it was vital that she that she mimic that uh, that transformation. So while we didn't seek Elle fanning out because she looked like Michelle Carter, it was sort of a it was sort of a dumb luck sort of a thing that Elle wanted to play the role and that she happened to have a resemblance to her. I I agree um, with uh, Maggie and like I I I think you know. Uh, the essence is so important and it's actually, it's like really interesting to me because I think I've seen performances with a lot of prosthetics where you like still don't get the essence of the person, you know? And so I think like um, uh, it was definitely something that we, that we were looking, we were just looking for the spirit of the character and the kind of, you know, and, and I think I was lucky because a lot of the people that it, the characters in the dropout, people didn't know what they look like, which is like, you know, something that's that's helpful. Um, and Amanda Seyfried, who plays Elizabeth Holmes, said, told me that someone she knows asked her if like what what chin prosthetics she was wearing. And she was like, I wasn't wearing any. And she thought that was like the biggest um compliment that someone she knew actually thought that she'd <laughs> changed her face or that she had makeup on her face so yeah I mean it's 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 definitely it, it kind of like an interesting casting question of like what you know what is the benefit of having you know somebody who looks exactly like the real person and what's not you know like I think there are some things where you know like you know George Schultz in our in the dropout who is played by Sam Watterson is incredible um, had this kind of like statesman, old statesman dignity to him, you know? And I think that like that, you know, that's more important than what his hair looked like, but I don't know, like, I guess those were, those were definitely questions that we were constantly asking ourselves and like sort of having to figure out, um, with casting. You all are so spoiled with your ensembles here and I just absolutely uh, love it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, ridiculous. <laughs> I think I think Liz, Rob and Lee and Patrick might be able to speak to this one. Can you walk us through how an actor also becomes a producer on a project? And then also maybe to highlight your specific productions, in what ways did your actors enhance the final product by working on it in a producerial capacity as well? Yeah, I mean, fortunately, with Jessica Beale and her production company, Iron Ocean, um, they had several hit TV shows under their belt already, you know, like, and it, ones that, that Jessica wasn't even in, you know, she's a legit producer. Um, at one point, you know, she thought that that's what she was going to do. You know, she told me, you know, when she was done looking like a clothes hanger coming off of her action star stint. Um, but uh she was incredible. I mean, her and her producing partner, Michelle Purple, um, really just took it upon themselves to make their job supporting me and um, basically trying to keep people away from me. But, you know, you also can't deny that you have Jessica Beale that opens a door to Melanie Linsky. You know, um, it's, it's, it's really important. And she's also aware that, like, if you know a meeting is 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 
getting not going the way that I want. She's like, let me know if you need me to jump in. And I'm like, okay, I'll let you know. You know, she was willing to be the heavy because, you know, at some point, if, you know, I'm arguing about what a post, what I want a poster to look like, and they're trying to railroad me, if Jessica Beale comes in and says, you're not using that photo of me, then they're not doing it. <laughs> you know? So I was very fortunate in, in, in having her and, and, and she was uh, nothing but an asset. And, you know, and uh, she had very few notes for me, but when she did, I would listen because she was usually right. I'm always right because she, she knows not to just say things for the sake of saying things. I think it's so important when a when a actor, especially a limited series, um, where they're you know, I mean, for example, the dropout was you know Amanda's in almost every scene, and it's like when you're when you have an, a character that's so much at the center of um, this the story. I I think it's and and it's going to be you know eight episodes you need the actor to feel empowered to, to be part of the creative process and to, you know, be part of the story and to be a representative on set. And I mean, I think that like, to me that I, I look for actors who want to be producers in a way, like I look for actors who want to like um, think about the project as a whole, think about like all of the artistic choices that are going to, to um, making something as opposed to, um, as opposed to just their their performance, although that's a huge, <laughs> huge thing. And when I say just their performance, it's you know, um, not nothing. But uh, oh god, okay, save me, <laughs> Lee, save me. Um, I just I I think it's really important uh, that that like an actor approaches uh, the the lead like that approaches the 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 project as something that they are really a part of that they really can be. Um, you know, have a creative say in it because if an actor doesn't feel that way, I don't think they give their best performance. I don't think that, that you know, they fully kind of um, immerse themselves in it. I was going to say that Anne Hathaway mainly did location scouting. She did a yeah. lot of <laughs> and she oversaw craft service. And then it turns out she was really good. And that was kind of the dumb luck of the whole thing. No, I mean, I, I completely agree with everyone. I mean, um, you know, you get actors of this caliber and particularly a lot of actors that are coming from features to do limiteds. And you're basically asking them to sign on for this extended 400, whatever, 80 page script that you haven't yet finished and say, yeah. trust me. <laughs> and you need, it just, the job's too hard. I mean, I, you know, I, I think that having strong collaborators challenges you in, in the best ways possible. So, it, you know, for Annie and Jared, it wasn't simply, it wasn't simply like, going through their characters, they were talking about the whole series as a whole. And we got to have really, you know, we had to have conversations about what late stage capitalism and, the, and what, you know, tech is like, but also we talked about relationships and marriages. And it felt like once the writers of the show departed and uh, my co-showrunner Drew Carbello and I were left to our own devices on set, Jared and Annie fully became our collaborators on it. And there were times where we threw things out that we were terrified of, but it was all, it always just made it better. And it didn't, it didn't feel casual. It did, it, you know, I think there was definitely a time where it felt like actors would take the credit because their agents negotiated it. And that has not been my experience. It feels, it feels completely additive. Can you imagine having to go order like a granola bar and like a tea from Anne Hathaway? <laughs> <laughs> Craft service, it would be. She, right. By the way, Anne Hathaway would have the best craft service. I actually, I wish that she would transition. I think she's incredibly <laughs> talented. I would work with her again in a second, but I actually think her calling, I, it would be the best. She would change the way that people think about craft service. I literally could do an entire conversation on how you think Anne Hathaway is going to evolve craft service. And I, I would believe, I would believe she's got the ability. <laughs> Patrick, anything you want to add to that one? No, I think they're they're everything they said is, is bang on. I'll actually go back in in time beyond Doctor Death and Girl from Plainville, and and I was doing a show called Happy that was on Sci Fi for uh, for a couple seasons, and Chris Maloney um, asked at the before the first season writers room opened if he could be in the writers room every day, and that sounds like the worst idea imaginable. Like the idea that the number one on the call sheet is going to be in the writer's room. It sounds like it should be disastrous. And I, I hesitantly said yes. And I told him it's hesitantly. 
and uh and it became the best he it was the best part of the entire process was having him in there um and he was in there all of season two as well i i said yes because i thought he was balking that he wasn't actually going to do it that he just come in every once in a while but he literally came every single day and in season two he came every single day including two blizzards in new york where he walked from his hotel to the writer's room it was just me brian taylor and chris maloney breaking story in 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 the writer's room and it was it's a it's a testament to the fact that if you've got the right partners then all of like the rules that are placed around show running and running writers rooms things like that can actually be completely thrown out because th as these guys have already said um the right partners know that what they're looking for is to is it's not just about their image their image is is burnished by the entire show and and as it relates to l from the same way l was in from the ground floor up and she was in every single meeting with every single department head ensuring that the people that were being hired were the people that she felt were going to be best for for the show and not just for the number one on the call sheet so i i will say that i've had nothing but there's there's been not a single nightmare incident in my entire career which means that it's all it's all downhill from here as it relates to partners who are actors who are also producers so so far it's been wonderful you clearly know how to pick the right partners it's not going to happen continue to go up and up from here no nah, there's um, a meteor think, that's got my name on it it's going to just do you hit think me. that chris do you think chris Bloody is available for writing jobs or <laughs> He's back, but can I like a quick? Well, like, like, can you send me a sample? I'm just putting it out in the universe. I will be. He wrote. Yeah, he he wrote back. an episode. He's very good. So yes, he he is definitely available. He's on hiatus from Law and Order right now. So yeah, go Great. at it. He's. Great. I'll put in a good word for you. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Love it. Making magic right on the spot in a virtual Q&A. Uh, Maggie, I'll reformat that question for you a little because I also think there's great opportunity for an actor who isn't wearing multiple hats to speak up and have their creative voice heard in ways that maybe go beyond the typical actor job description. So do you have an example of a time on the staircase where someone stepped up and expressed how they felt about a certain something and it influenced the show for the better? Well, while everyone was speaking about the actor producer title, it, to me, I was like, although the actors weren't producers, it was very a, a similar experience in that everyone was very invested in their character arcs, especially because we're using concurrent timelines and trying to figure out exactly where you are emotionally in the context of an episode, even though it's 20 years apart. Um, so, but I think also the the nature of the staircase too um, lent itself to a lot of speculation about what happened that night. So there was a lot of conversations uh, with people with a variety of opinions, and then of course whether or not having opinion actually was fundamental to understanding what did occur that night. So I think in that sense, the the community that was created through through the actors um that was very important to the show because it was there was such a strong family dynamic um and yeah so I, I know that's not very specific but i think generally speaking it was that was really important um to making a show in atlanta for seven months and having no one go batshit crazy <laughs> yeah, I mean, having been in Atlanta for seven months over Omicron and four holidays <laughs> and also a story where you can't really know what happened. And there's a lot of like Pablo Schreiber, who is not a producer on the set, um, would call me and we would discuss every script uh, and storylines that that wasn't his character just because he um, is uh, scary smart. And also, you know, theater trained and everything. And he just wanted to understand the world and just love the project. And, and I, I truly cherished those conversations that we had. And, you know, my, my position is if, if I can't defend what I've written, then I need to reconsider it. And if you can convince Pablo Schreiber, then you're bulletproof. <laughs> I have so many follow ups. I'll, I'll go here first because Maggie kind of brought it up in uh, her last answer unless my brain is failing me, I think literally all of your shows do this where they adopt nonlinear storytelling formats. So can you each kind of speak to why that particular approach to telling this story was the way to, you know, most powerfully bring it to screen and give the audience the experience with that story that you wanted them to have versus other coverage that's out there? 
when we broke the entire se uh, season, every episode was bookended. Um, and so we were kind of, we were jumping back and forth in time. And then as we kind of looked at it holistically, once we had all eight scripts written, we realized that it really worked well for the pilot. And we kind of want to throw the audience in and just kind of, we, we felt like there was a tension and kind of a question that, that needed to be answered. Um, and then as we started looking at those kind of those other flashes that we had, it felt like it felt like a device that wasn't it wasn't working as well as we wanted it to work. And once we're kind of once the show was on its feet a bit, we started stripping out those scenes. The episodes started playing much better. And then we started adding all of those things to kind of create to kind of really formulate our finale. We, we it was like all these kind of disparate scenes that actually worked way better within the kind of the body of one episode rather than. Um, as bookends. I, I feel like you're just bragging that you had all eight episodes written and then had <laughs> enough time to go back and <laughs> change the first That's what episode. I that's what I heard, Liz. That's exactly what I heard. <laughs> Are you guys not so far ahead that uh no, I mean by the way, it, that that meant that seemed so much more casual than what actually happened. <laughs> There's a lot of I didn't mention the tears. <laughs> oh my god. Well it's I mean I don't know like I I remember kind of going into going into the dropout and being like, I am not doing deposition flashbacks. <laughs> and then like the first like scene one was like deposition. No, it's just like I because it's 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 really um it's hard to I think when you're doing a limited series that is going to take up a lot of time and, and go really deep on characters and, you know, cover a lot of years, like you, you, you want to have the time to really, like, I wanted to have the time to really explore Elizabeth's childhood and, you know, her, her college years. But I also felt like, you know, if, if I hadn't, if I didn't explain to the audience kind of like where we were headed um, in early on, then it would be like, why are we watching this girl? <laughs> like hang out in college. So I think I, I, I felt like I just sort of felt like I needed to, you know, I, I, I needed the audience to kind of know a little bit of where, of where we're going, but I have to say like the other show, like you're all, all of your shows, I think like do it in, in a, in a more graceful, uh, skilled way. So thank you for that. <laughs> that is definitely not true. I know. Like, for, for what it's worth, everyone does it in their own specific way where it's very distinct from one another. And I, I don't know, my personal opinion is that it really does enhance all of your individual stories, which is something else and shows how much potential there is in this medium and in the storytelling format. Yeah. I mean, I think, we wanted to take it to a place because our ending is a bit ambiguous. Um, Spoiler. <laughs> uh, we've been saying it enough. I'm like, <laughs> prepare yourselves. Um, that um, we wanted it to be nonlinear. And so for us, we wanted our timelines to actually connect. So even though we had rules for each of our timelines that they would, once they started, they would always be moving forward our past timeline ends where our present timeline begins. So the idea is that it's a circle and that there is no ending. And so it kind of thematically made sense that we could kind of continue that with the construction of the series. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't solve it. <laughs> wow. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I mean, I guess I'll still watch it. Fine, whatever. Well, I think there is something to be said about each of our shows, and to, again, to varying degrees, of that it is a bit of like the Titanic. We do know how these shows yeah. end, and so you you have to. They show all them. are happy. They all have the yeah, exactly. happy, <laughs> just like the Titanic. Wonderful ending. Yeah. <laughs> But no, I mean, it's like you have to show the viewer that like we recognize that there is kind of a known ending to this already. And we're still going to be telling you a story and asking you questions that you don't know the answers to and constructing that in the narrative. And like a very a way to do that is with not using a linear timeline. Um, and so I think, you know, just as a device, it's helpful to create intrigue. Yeah, my, my wife claims that I don't know how to write a linear story, which to be fair, I've written like 40 pilots and none of them are linear. I, I, I have no idea how to do it, quite frankly. Um, but as it relates, she's always right. But as it relates to Dr. Death in particular, I'll just speak to that. If I had made that, my choice for that, even though I don't know how to write linear, is also that if I had 
written it in a linear fashion, while it still would have been really compelling, I think, you know, with Christopher Dunst as, as the, the, you're following that lead, you wouldn't have gotten to Christian Slater and Alec Baldwin until episodes five or six. There would be no, there would have been no chase. There would have been no investigation. And, and even though that just is, is purely mechanical uh, in terms of storytelling, it's vitally important that you're keeping that sense of propulsion going in, in your series. And, and while I think Alec and Christian both would have really enjoyed only being in like three episodes so they could have worked less but gotten paid the same amount of money, I, I refused that. I made them work. But it was, um, but that was purely because I needed a chase. And that's why we did it that way. When you talk to your wife, do you kind of flash back? <laughs> is, your, is your marriage like nonlinear as well? Like <laughs> it, 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 Look, all I'm doing is live. We met when we were 18. I'm just living at quarter pitcher night uh, in Washington, D.C. at 18 when I met her <laughs> just because I looked better then. And so I want to just live there. I also, I'm developing I'm developing a new project with a writer who wrote uh who basically had the same construction of We Crashed and all of these shows, and it was nonlinear. And uh, and my first note was like, "That's over. We need to. We need to. We need to try something else." And it was like, "Linear is very cool." So linear we like, is cool we're, now. We're going, we're going very. We're we're going very heavy on linear these days. I'm developing two new shows now, both of which are nonlinear. <laughs> so I <laughs> let the game begin. Right now. <laughs> You do it very well. So all the power to you. And I can't wait to see those now. <laughs> Speaking of uh, the creative touch in some of these stories. So Robin, I'm going to go to you on this one, because another thing that I heard was that it was your idea to have Betty there in the final courtroom scenes of Candy, which is a very, very powerful choice that really amplifies that particular sequence. Can you walk us through what it's like coming up with an idea like that and then talking to your actor and your director to make sure that you all fully understand what the goals are for a, a pretty significant creative swing like that? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it A, it, it was something that I, I sprung on the writer's room like literally overnight. I just came in wild-eyed, you know, and I was just like, you guys! <laughs> But where it came from was um, partly from my deep theater background and partly um, from just really spending so much time with these women. The fact that Candy got to tell her story and Betty didn't um, and just how ignored uh, Betty has been. Um, we couldn't factually tell um, you know, what happened from Betty's point of view, because we're just never going to know. We're never going to know. But it did feel very good to at least have her there to indict these people who were ignoring her, particularly her husband and the jury who just would rather this all just go away. Um, and, you know, when you have Melanie Linsky, it, it's a particularly, you know, powerful uh, presence, you know, just her standing there is an indictment of all of these people. The director who uh, has known me since my theater days um, was able to dial me back from going, you know, full uh, theater. Like I was just like, but what if the jury then becomes the town? And what if, you know, like now Sherry's the judge and he's just like, you need to bring it back. <laughs> And I was like, yes, you know, because you start here and then you end where you're supposed to be. And, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, we we had Melanie who I said to her at one point, like, I, I need you to say this line in three different locations because I'm not going to know until the edit, you know, where it's going to be the most impactful. And it's the, it's the message that we that we need to get across. And and fortunately, she was just like, absolutely. I trust you. You know, we'll do it. We'll do it. And so it it started off as a as a wild idea from me that my collaborators were able to distill into a good idea and then you know all these artists jumped in and and, and made it a, a reality which i'm very proud of Oh my, I have so many more questions for all of you. We're, we're winding down on time and I wanted to make sure that I pose this to the entire group before we close this out. Big question, what advice would you give to an actor out there who is eager to make the absolute most of their collaboration with their showrunner? Just do everything we said. <laughs> 
no, no. everything Liz says. That's my. That's my. No, I can I can say what I I can tell what I what I what I've told acting students is that um, start with doing my words. Start like don't come in and just start ad libbing because I'm insecure. I worked really hard on that. <laughs> And it's like right out of the gate, you're telling me this is trash. I can do better Then that's not helpful. And if you're, you know, when, when you're a really spectacular actor, if you say my words and they don't sound right, I'm going to know and I'm going to change it. Yeah. I think, I mean, I particularly on our show and someone else actually said it better than me, so I should be crediting them, but I'm not sure who it was, but these, the, you are, the actors are spending they're spending a lot of time with the characters. And I, I think it is important to start with understanding what the showrunner's intention is, but it's also, if there are questions, it's important to have those discussions in, you know, in an appropriate time and place. And I do think that can lead to at least a, a better collaboration. Um, I don't know, I, I've always questioned authority. And since now I am the authority, I would say question me to some degree. <laughs> And yeah, but so I get, I, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think say what I wrote. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel like, I feel like you're totally right. Like questioning in, in the right, at the right moment is yeah. amazing. Is, is kind of like, a, a, I, I love when like a, when I can have like a real conversation with an actor about the part that they're playing and, and just like, you know, I hope that I make the right, you know, I hope that I give people time and space to do that in the right way so that they feel comfortable. And um, I think like, it's, it's, it, I mean, it's that kind of like artistic relay race where it's like, we've done a lot of work before actors come to the table sometimes. And so it's like, you know, just acknowledging what Robin said of like, I worked really hard on this. <laughs> But then, like, definitely not having, not not being so deferential that you're not, you know, able to kind of like um, really talk about it and work on it because I, that's that's the magic of of doing this, and that's why we're not like you know writing books, you know, because we have to we have to uh, talk about it with other people. Well, like, ah. I mean, it goes back to what Patrick said at the beginning about like you have all of these, you know, hundreds of people and wonderful artists who come onto your project and then you get the credit for it. If, if you have a wonderful relationship with your artist, the actor artists, they're thinking about this character on a, on a whole different level than you have. And maybe you're stuck in your mind. And so, like, I deeply yeah. appreciate these conversations with actors who can bring like a different element of humanity to, you know, what I've done, but, you know, don't tell me right. My writing's trash. <laughs> I, I was, some, I, go ahead, Lee. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say for me, I mean, my favorite part of what we do is collaborating. I pretty much for every single thing I do, I have some, I at least have a writing staff and usually I have someone else who's co-writing with me. And then you, you just keep bringing people in and there's actors and there's prop prop masters and there's location scouts and all of these people are bringing their expertise and their thoughts and they're challenging the material and those conversations i guess to me it's like trust and if you you came up you came along because you trusted my words enough that you decided to audition or probably for the actors that we're talking about were offered the roles and were desperate that they would take them um but you you just want to have you you want to develop enough of a uh a trust between them that that they believe they believe that you have kind of these this eight hour story in your head or 22 hours or whatever the the format is and that they also that you also have the trust in them that they can push back and that the best idea will win and i like i've never worked it's never worked well when it's about ego and i would love if like i hope that everyone is smarter than me that would be the best version uh to me of, to me of a project because i'm incredibly smart <laughs> I I was going to say being smarter than me is an incredibly short curb to trip over. So there's there's a laundry list of people who are smarter than me. That's <laughs> I will you know I'll just everything they said is bang on. The only thing that I will add on is because of how you framed the question, which was actors who are just starting out, and and so the so the only addendum that I will throw on, which is a, another version of what everybody here has, has already said is is the same advice i would also give to writers who are just quote unquote starting out which is to remain humble 
Um, there, there is plenty of time for you to let humility go right out the window. Um, but when you are just starting out, there is a lot to learn. And there are, are a lot of um, protocols, isn't necessarily the right word, but, but how you act on a set and when you decide to do things uh, and how you decide to do them, which is exactly what these guys were saying, which is the right place and the right time is vitally important. And in my opinion, um, the even like the, you know, the really experienced actors that I've had the honor, and I mean that to, to work with, each of them knew what the right time and right place was as well. And they could have been the ones that called you out in the middle of the set or told you that your writing was trash, which I agree with Robin. Don't worry. I know my writing is trash. You don't have to tell me that. Okay? <laughs> it's totally. It's okay. I'm, I'm there. I'm there before you. Um, but it's, it, you know, the, 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 the people who are most experienced on set, in my opinion, know the right place and the right time and approach the conversation, maybe not with as much humility as a, someone starting out should, but they, but they do, they do come to it with a place of respect. And you hear horror stories about, about actors who, who throw respect out the window and who throw humility out the window. Same goes for writers, same goes with producers, same goes with directors. And those quite frankly, are the people that, I, I keep a, a naughty list. I have a naughty list. And they, and while you may not want to work with me again, I assure you, if you cross that boundary, I'll never work with you again either. And all it is, all it comes down to is being a good human being. Robin and I talked about this in, in, uh, in Denver. I put a premium on being a good human being. And those are the people that I want around me. And, and that comes from a place of respecting people and respecting their work all the time. So that, Can that's the last one. list in the chat? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hang on, but it's, I, I actually, I have a zip file. Is it possible <laughs> that I could just send that to you? Yeah. I, would, I, I, also, I would also say that, like, I, I think another fun thing with limited series is like, I, there, I don't know, at least in our, in our show, we just, we, there's so many roles, like there's so many parts and like things like it's such a big world and a big canvas. And so I think if you are starting out and you have like a smaller role, there's, there's still so much you can do, you know, um, and, and to just, just to kind of approach it and, and really think about every part of like your character and, and their, their humanity and what's going on with them and, and the way that you would do a big role, I think, cause you can see it on the screen. And I think like, like in, in all of these series, like I use, I see actors kind of doing so much with, with sometimes small roles and, it, and people remember and they watch, I just wanted to go out on like a slightly more positive note than the naughty list, but I am very interested. <laughs> <laughs> the naughty list came with a, a premium on working with good collaborators who are kind to one another. So I, I like going out on that particular note. I do have to let you all go. Before I do, though, I want to repeat your show titles, because in case anyone out there is not caught up, please write this down. Nobody writes anything. Write it in your phone and go check out these shows. The Dropout, the Staircase, Candy, We Crashed. The Girl from Plainville and Dr. Death wholeheartedly recommend them to you all. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. On behalf of the SAG After Foundation, I want to thank you for sharing your experiences, your process, and your craft with your fellow creators. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you.